So um, I'll start with this. Uh, he wanted me to help make something like this to post. So I've done this, and it's not very central to what I'm doing, but it's kind of fun. Uh, so this says just what Rob has just said. The environment changes from here to there, for example, with altitude or with latitude. And with that comes changes in processes and organisms. And uh, so segments of that need to be recognized. And your work is split up in reclamation or wildlife management or whatever you're doing. Your work is likely to split on those segments. And that has been formalized in uh, European ecology since who knows when. Dobbenmeyer brought that west to us, the Pacific Northwest. Fabulous stuff he's done. His students are Pfister and Mugler, among others, and they have brought Mugler grassland stuff to Montana, Pfister forest stuff to Montana. So we're segmenting the environment and we're saying, you could do a lot of environmental measures. It would be costly, temperature, precipitation, and so on. You can use vegetation as an indicator of those. So I'm going to just take some segments of vegetation. You'll know all these segments. i just show you a few things that I have seen in them. This is kind of a hobby with me, if you like. Uh, my big projects have not been this, but it's something that I've been interested in, and uh, my students <coughs> have too. Okay, what's it say there? Uh, so we could use that for managing weeds, for managing production, for managing reclamation. That is, uh, are things that you might be interested in. And then down here at the bottom was a few things about, uh, uh, about who I am better cut off. And this is a, Rob asked for a photo that he could show of something I was interested in. I'm not much into photos. And so I had to struggle with that. But this particular place is east of Bridger Bowl and the Bangtail. And this is a very windswept meadow coming across here. And it shows all scrunched down into one little area most of the environmental gradient that we'll be talking about. So this is very windswept. It's dry. There is 12 trees that I planted years ago. Uh, you may have trouble counting them. Uh, and then over in this area, there's a dense round top forest. Those are dug fir with some limber pine, kind of lowish. You certainly have that around here right out the window. We're seeing that same zone. And then these trees are sheltering these trees. So up in here, they become pointed. So that goes from the Doug fir zone to the subalpine fir zone in, you know, significantly less than 1,000 feet. Is that 500? Your guess is better than mine. Uh, and then at the joint between such grassland and these forests, you commonly find sagebrush. It's all right there, uh, scrunched up into one place. And I should not fall into this, but uh, 50 years ago, we installed some snow fences like that, and we've been looking to see what would happen if you put extra snow onto this grassland. And as a matter of fact, uh, that's recently been published in Nature, which is uh, pretty nice. Uh, okay, now that I'm gonna switch from the regular tech to high tech, and we'll see if I can still run this thing. Uh, Okay, so here's this. Now, we could segment that a little finer, and we could say in the bottom are, is the Great Basin shrublands. We're not supposed to have much of that. That's supposed to be in Utah, Nevada, but out towards uh, Deer Lodge, for example, you'll see these Atroplex and Sarcobatus uh, plants. Uh, I think of them as being, uh, the, the, the Sarcobatus has got little pickles for leaves. It, they're cylindrical, and they taste salty if you eat them. Blue Grandma, how many know that? Blue Lua? Uh, okay, it's common. I mean, I just was looking at it uh, 
as I was coming over Pipestone, a very low grass, uh, certainly less than two inches, curly leaves. Uh, Blue Brunch wheatgrass, that's the state grass of Montana. It is a grass that occurs in bunches. Uh, and again, that's something that you might well know. Uh, oh, this is fairly light. You can follow this exactly in that handout you have. It's, it's not 100% clear that it's better to use the, uh, the overhead. Uh, Idaho fescue, that's one you're not likely to know, I think. Does anyone know that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Rick and I worked long, long ago with some Microtus species. Uh, uh, Ponderosa, excuse me? Don't tell them how long. Well, I say that I've been at MSU for about mm, 10 years, and that was early in my career, so maybe that fits in. I'm 59 now. Ponderosa pine, you have to know that. Common over by Missoula, common in the eastern, southeastern Montana, uh, not between here and, and Bozeman. Cedar hemlock, we could omit that from this talk. You find that in the Glacier Park area and westward. Doug fir becomes very important again for us. Uh, so uh, again, I'm pretty confident that you will know that. You recognize it by looking at the cones and behind the cone scales, there are rat tails sticking out. Subalpine fir are the ones that have the very pointed top that we just <laughs> lost there. Uh, and then alpine, again, high. And there's always uh, uh, handsome women up there singing, right? You know that, the sound of music. Um, let's see. OK. now. Uh, we have those things displayed, and we could ask how they fit together. So ignore the bottom part of this graph and look at the top. Um, and what you see here is the efforts of one student, uh, beginning graduate student. You could do it just as well. Uh, we gridded the Bridger Mountains uh, with a grid. Every half mile, there's a point. And then we wrote down what was occurring at that point, the altitude, the elevation, the rock, and the uh, uh, altitude, and the, the plant cover. Now, does that sound like a lot of work? Not really. How would you do it if you were, you know, didn't like to be outdoors? You take the maps that exist, and you overlay that. And for every one of those points on a topographic map, you can read it off the altitude and the slope and aspect of that point. And then you can get a cover type map, and you can read that off similarly. And then for geology, you can read that off of another map. So this person named Dave Perry, who was just starting back, you know Dave? Uh, he was fabulous, uh, did all of this. And he's gone on to, he just couldn't get a grant less than a million dollars. And I could tell you what he thought his strategy was. At any rate, take this one right here and <coughs> look at the bottom. And it says grass. It's mostly grass down at the bottom. You can look right out the window and see that, mostly grass. As you go up, grass becomes a little less common. And then there's a blank. There's, there probably is something growing in there, but it's not shown in that graph. Then it comes up into subalpine fir, and subalpine fir is greater than 20% up there. And then you go above that top line, that has to be the alpine. Okay? Now, the reason for leaving that out is to simplify it. So take this one, and that looks at what fills that in. So in the south and the west and the north, there's Douglas fir. So just superimpose that on that, you can see that the middle is mostly Douglas fir. Uh, then in the north, that's still the north here, there's Douglas fir. Okay? And then this d dashed line is where the lodgepole pine is. So again, that's a tree that you may well know. You, you ought to know that if you don't. Okay? Uh, so there is a, a chart which has been amazingly often cited by others as telling you where to find these things. That's not my favorite way. I would rather uh, use uh, some more 
uh, measurable kinds of data. So I'm going to try getting at that for you. And so here is something about the climate that you would find if we walked from here uh, to the, the ridge tops above. You're a little different than here because you have so much granite on top. Uh, we have less granite in the Bozeman area, but it's all the same. Uh, we tried to find 10 separate places uh, that we could get data. It's all stolen from uh, official data of one kind or another. Now, what do you think will happen to the temperature as you go up in altitude? I think you probably have an idea there. So let's ask about the high temperatures. If we take the highest temperatures that we've got, and we'll do it in, in Fahrenheit, and we'll take average. So what month is that likely to come out in? It's going to be in July, right? Uh, so we can look here. The average temperature is going to be about 88 uh, down in the Sarcobatis, 87 in the Boulou. That's down baseline stuff out by Anaconda or east by, uh, what did we say, Ringing Rocks. You've been there, I'm sure. And then the Ponderosa Pine is still 90. Up through Idaho Fescue, it's falling off to 80. Up into the forest, it's falling off to 72, 78 and the tundra and the white bark pine are as low as 53 in the summer. So I think that gives you a, a basic picture. Now, here before the asterisk are larger numbers, and those are the record highs for all those places. And they're completely parallel. It gets cooler as you go up. You knew that before I said, OK. Now we can look at the lows, and what will happen to the lows? Uh, it looks like the low in the Alpine is low. It's cold up there. And the low, the whitebark pine, which is the top edge of the subalpin fir, it's low. Subalpin fir is low, OK? Douglas fir is low. And then we get down here into the grasslands, and the temperature starts getting warmer. So it's cold up top, and it gets warmer. And then strangely, when we come to Boulou, to these low places, it cools off again, uh, and then we can come down into the sarcobatus. It cools off still more. And you could ask, what's happening there? Uh, let's just leave that. Uh, I'd say there's uh, somehow maybe there's air flowing down slope. Do you think that? Now, look at this other one, the absolute lows. What happens there? The absolute lows are minus 36, minus 32 in these high places. That seems pretty cool. But the absolute lows, when we come down into this grassland zone, are minus 43, minus 42, minus 50. So the cooler air is running down slope out of that. Now, from your skiing experience, have you ever felt that? I don't know. You'll have to know. OK, now I'm going to skip over the frost-free data and look at the precipitation data. What happens to rainfall on this gradient? And again, we've got 10 stations or thereabouts average for each of these. And down in the bottom, Pudalua Sarcobatus, 18 inches uh, centimeters per year, 35 centimeters. 35 is a foot, isn't it? 35 centimeters is a foot. 33 actually, and then you run up to the top and you get 99 centimeters uh, in the higher places. So how much is 99 centimeters? Is that, is that a yard? So it's a meter stick, and a meter stick is what? Three inches longer than a, a, uh, a yard stick? Is that right? Yeah. Um, okay, so you keep getting more water as you go up. So that may be controlling that gradient too. Now there's a, a, an index that Dobbenmeyer has uh, worked out and it says that these higher places down through Doug Fir are not likely to have their plants ever suffering from lack of water. It's an extreme statement. And then as you come down into these grasslands uh, the ones that are right where Butte is, right where Missoula is, likely to have a month of drought in those grasslands. 
Then we come down here in the Vulua, you might have as much as two months that are dry. So again, that's the rain shadow east of the pass here, uh, pipestone pass, bringing rocks, and that's, uh, uh, that's an example. Three Forks is another example. Uh, and then the next column, we needn't discuss that. Uh, people often talk about growing plants growing in the frost-free season when there isn't any frosts, and we can take a look at how that works. Uh, growing season months would be months when it was warm and had water, okay? And then, uh, I'm not sure we need to push that too much. Uh, plants don't grow linearly with temperature, right? There is a Q10, uh, are you familiar with the Q10? I think I'll pass on that, okay? So uh, there might be a correction for temperatures, which we might use more in a minute, okay? So if you're asking about the environment of some place, you're about to reclaim it, right? Um, what do you ask about besides the temperature when you're, for instance, choosing plants you might plant there? You might ask something about the soils. So here is, again, a catalog of work from Soil, Soil Conservation Service. What's that called now? Do you know that? Natural Resource Conservation Service. That's correct. Say it louder so others Natural can Natural Resource Conservation Exactly. So this is their data before they changed their name. Doesn't matter. Here's the same list of, of things. And you look at the water holding capacity of the soil. If you get a lot of rain somewhere, is it gonna stay there? If you have a meter of water that falls in a given place, can the plants just use that? Not if it runs off, not if it runs through. So it's interesting to know how much water a soil can hold. If we go to the top 50 centimeters of the soil in tundra, it normally can hold about four centimeters. How much is a centimeter? The width of your little finger, right? it can hold only a very small amount of water. We go down into subalpine fir, it's only about three centimeters, about the same. Douglas fir, maybe 10, 10 centimeters. Uh, 10 centimeters is the width of your hand, isn't it? And then you come down into these grasslands. Why is the soil able to hold more water down here at low altitude than higher up? Up here, it's mostly sand, can't hold much. Down here, you have finer particles. Do you use that in reclamation? I bet you do, okay? Uh, then you can ask about the organic matter, tons per hectare. So these are metric tons. Uh, is that the same, 2,000 pounds? We needn't bother with that. A metric ton's a little heavier. Uh, 2,200 pounds. So here at the top, the tundra has 124 metric tons per hectare. Hectare is two acres, right? Uh, that is a lot. And look down here, when we get into the forest, it goes down to uh, a quarter of that, doesn't it? 35, 45. And then when we get down into the grasslands, it goes up again. What's happening there? Uh, up here, we've got a lot of peat, basically. Uh, plant material preserved by coldness. And then in here, there isn't any plant material there under the ground because the trees keep the organic matter in their stems above the ground. And then we could come on down into here and we get into grasslands. Grasslands have roots below the surface, so the uh, organic matter goes up again. The nitrogen is completely parallel with that. Why should the nitrogen be parallel? with the organic matter. Is the soil going to hold nitrogen very well? I think not. It only is held if it's bound. Is that covalent or ionic? If it's bound to the organic matter. Who wants to say that? Covalent or ionic? Covalent. Exactly. Exactly. Very good. Okay. Uh, now then, here are three more elements that we might think plants care about. Potassium tons per hectare, 
and calcium tons per hectare and magnesium. Now what you see is there's hardly any in the tundra, the white bark pine, the subalpine fir. And then as we go down slope, we get quite a lot more. Why do you suppose calcium is not so much at high altitude? Two factors we've already looked at in this table. High rainfall, those are soluble. Let's see, is that ionic or covalently bound to the soils? I think it's maybe ionic, isn't it? So those tend to wash out. And what else makes a difference? These soils are sandy and these soils are clay rich. So these soils can hold it better, okay? Now, can you absorb all that in two minutes? I doubt it. That's why I gave you a sheet that you can come along and I'm gonna uh, suggest quiz questions to Rob <laughs> to forward to you. Um, okay, so maybe we'd like to have some plants growing in this landscape. So here's a really nice table and I'm sure that uh, I can call on somebody to know what the first line there is without looking at his sheet. Uh, but what I want to do first is to say, let's list these communities across the top. Bula is the dry grassland, and then we go up through several other grasslands, and then we come into Doug Fir right in here, and then we go up into the subalpine fir here, and then we come up into the alpine in the top. Okay, if we list the plant species here, they ought to bunch up. There ought to be a bunch of species who would like to grow in the Bulua grassland, in the dry grasslands. And then there ought to be a bunch of species which would like to grow in the sagebrush, and they ought to be set over because the community is set over here. Does that make sense? So we ought to see a diagonal of species, and, uh, and so these are all in order and you can see what the basic species are that are growing in all of those habitat types. This could be done better, but it's the best you have at hand, okay? Uh, so, who are some of these? There's Bula, that's the type that has, oh, and look, it's got it. And there's Stipocomata, and it's listed right there. So that's convincing. And then we can come down here and we say, those are shrubland types. And there's sagebrush right there, that's nice. And then here is rough fescue, uh, which you almost certainly don't know. And then we move into some shrubs. We can move down into here. Uh, Douglas fir is right there, uh, and aspen. You know, around Butte, you're very uh, impressed with how aspen and Douglas fir go together, right? The bottom of the Douglas fir is aspen when you start off east, and that deserves uh, some nice study. Uh, and then we come down into here is the subalpine fir zone and then we begin to get these alpine species. So that's good. Now there's a uh, thing that happens here that's uh, you might, it's a little odd. So you'd like to have them all strung up like that but there are some species which have a very wide range on this altitudinal gradient. So here's a list of those, and I marked one, Agripyrans bicatum. Look at that, it goes all the way from the Budalua stipa type up into the Abies type. It goes all the way from down here up into the Alpine. Isn't that amazing? Uh, then we could come down here. Well, there's a bunch of other strawberries are like that, have a very wide range. And you, you can look at these, I don't need to walk through every one but these are types that you have. Now we could move down into here and we've come to something that's really curious. It makes sense that somebody might have a broader range than that. Has a broader ecological amplitude is the term we would use for that. Okay, but down here, isn't this weird? Here's a bunch of species which are here and then appear again at higher altitude. High altitude and low altitude. Let's think about how that could come to be. You know, I think I'm gonna run out of time if I think too much. So let's set it aside, but I've set that aside in this chart for you to think about. 
it'd be horrible for you to imagine that I might have done it for anyone else either. I did it specifically for you. I did it last night. Uh, now, if that works for native plants, it ought to work for a uh, high altitude plant, excuse me, for weeds as well. So right down here are species which uh, go on a diagonal like that. There are species that are primarily at low altitude. So Agripyron cristatum, crested wheatgrass, is a nasty weed that only grows at low altitude. Alyssum alisoides is another one. There's a lot of effort to control it and so on. Then there are going to be ones that are primarily at high altitude, and that's like the clovers. Okay? Now, if there were ones that have broad ranges, then they're the broad range ones. And if they're ones that have a gap in the middle, they're the gap ones. So do we need to go through all those species? Uh, you may like to. Uh, uh, I think that if I want to stay more or less on time, that I should not list them off. What are some of these weeds that have split ranges? Uh, I think I'll pass on that. Okay, so a little bit ago, I was telling you about environmental qualities that you could have that might be controlling vegetation. And now here, we've gone, we're gonna go from, we have these communities, they could be forests, they could be grasslands <coughs> and so on. And we could ask, what's their production? What is production? Production is the grams per meter squared per year that is produced in that place. So if you're a cattleman, you'd like to have a high production, right? Like to have a lot of grass produced. If you're a forester, you'd like to have a lot of forest produced. Okay, one thing is production, and the other thing is called standing crop. Standing crop is how much is actually there. Okay, so let's look here. Boodaloo has a standing crop of about a, um, a gram, uh, about a ton per hectare. And then we can go up here, Agripyrans bicatum. Do I not have one? I, I don't have one. Okay, Idaho fescue, something like a ton per hectare, maybe two tons per hectare, okay? And then we could go up into the Alpine, one to two tons per hectare. That's the standing crop. If you took your lawnmower out and mowed it down, that's what you'd get. You could just mow a sample of that. <coughs> now look at these forests instead. There's the eastern ponderosa pine is 200 tons per hectare. Or the cedar hemlock is 300 tons per hectare. Or the Douglas fir is 100 to 300 tons per hectare. Sabah Pan Far is 100 to 250 tons per hectare. Why do the forests have so much greater masses? Why are they so many more tons per hectare? Because they have all that wood there. They're good, frugal trees. They save it all up, right? So it can accumulate. And the loggers love it that they saved it all up. Yeah, okay. The grass is dumped. You have to bring your cows in and use it each year uh, if you're dealing with the grasses. Okay, now here is next to that is the actual production, how much is produced in each year. So if we take the grass or the alpine or the Idaho fescue, the, uh, the figures ought to be fairly similar to the standing crops because the grass all dies in the autumn and then it's replaced in the next year. That ought to be what we get. The uh, production in the, uh, <clears throat> in the uh, forest ought to be very much less than the trees because it hasn't been saved up over time. So look down the production line. Uh, there is variation here from one ton per hectare, something like that, up to 200, 300 tons. It's 200 times as great, right? Now, if we look at this, uh, 
the production doesn't have anywhere near the same span. So this is 100 to 200 grams. Uh, the Idaho fescue is 150 to 200. The Abulu is 100. And the, the forest is more productive. It has uh, 400 to 500. So let's say that it's uh, four times more productive. Why should the forest be more productive? It might be that it has more resources. It might be that it's moister. Or it might be that it has more nutrients. Subalpine fir, we ought to be hiding. We don't have a measure for subalpine fir. So the nutrients should be short there. Okay, so I'm going to be interested in what controls the production. Whether I'm a, a rancher or a logger, I'm going to be interested in what controls the production. So um, how do you answer a question like that? One way that ecologists do that is they look at the uh, correlation between uh, one factor and another. They look to see if yield goes up with temperature or if yield goes up with water. And if it goes up nicely, you should have a nice linear relationship. If it's just all over every place, you say, I don't think that's the controlling factor. And so you, you shouldn't give it up quite yet. But here's a trial at this kind of a thing. We can take, let's see, try to get that right side up. OK. So we can say, let's take the, uh, let's take the growing season months. We mentioned that before. How, how many warm months do we have? And we can read that right out of here, growing season months. And then we can <coughs> graph that against these uh, production measures that we've found over here and see if it's a good graph. Now, here's the graph. And you're going to look at it and tell me whether you think temperature predicts the yield perfectly. And down here, maybe you'll say it sort of does, but up here it totally goes to hell. Right? <coughs> Okay, so that's, uh, we're going to forget that for a minute. And then we could come down here, the growing season months times the temperature. We're going to try to get those growing season months together with temperature. And that ought to really be good, right? So we can look at that. It's a little better, but there's still quite a bit of scatter. And then we can correct the growing season months for, uh, for the Q10, which we decided a while ago that we weren't going to talk about today. And that gets a little better. But look at what we, happens if we only use the growing season. That's the months when it is warm and moist. You know, that's not horrible. If you had a graph like that, would you say they're well correlated? I think that we would. So I'm going to say until we have some additional data that the growing season months is the primary thing that's happening when it's both warm and moist. OK. So um, this has been some proper ecology up to now. And sometimes we get off on horrible sidetracks. We start thinking about animals. So. We're just going to say that those are creepy decomposers, right? Whatever they are, they're just grinding up perfectly good plant material and breaking it down. So, uh, so here's bird diversity in 10 vegetation types, same old vegetation types. And you, we're always talking about diversity. And I personally am not very excited about diversity. That's just my own. I'm writing a paper about it right now. but. Uh, uh, if we just do that in a conventional way, we can see that the tundra and the Idaho fescue don't have very many species. And so this is Brent Hagman working with me in this. Uh, and uh, so, and then down here in the Artemisia and the Bulua, 
uh, it's six to five to six species. Now, how would you find something like that out? You know, you could go out and beat your head against the bush for a long time. This is a phenomenally difficult thing to find 10 sites in each of those and to go out repeatedly during the season for, to those sites and then repeatedly across years, that's phenomenally difficult. Now, this Hagland guy, uh, he uh, managed to come up with something cleverer than that. How would you answer a question that was a difficult question uh, uh, if, if you wanted to without just, I mean, you, you couldn't even do it with a team of people, right? So what do you do? You're going to go to published data and you're going to look to find out how many birds per hectare there are that are breeding. That's what people normally do. They say that if you're not a breeding creature, you're not worth paying attention to because it's not going into the next generation. So there's quite a lot of data like that. He was able to find that, and we've got these numbers. So again, there's not many birds in the, in the grassy kinds of places. When we get into a tree kind of place, there get to be more. So instead of three or four, there's uh, 10 to 20. That's nice. Is that consistent with your own observations? Do you see more bird species when you go into a forest than you do when you're in the grassland? Uh, the data says they're there. If you don't, it must be that you're not noticing them. And I think birds are awfully hard to see. Uh, so I'll, I'll be sympathetic with that. And then right down here is the cottonwood forest has 36 birds in its vegetation type. That is wild, and we could ask why that is. And I'm gonna say, if you are in a cottonwood forest, you're near water, and you're near nests, and you've got wheat fields on either side of the river, you have the best of all possible worlds. Lots of feed, lots of water, lots of nests. Uh, I'm just sticking my neck out. I didn't interview these birds myself. Okay. Now, what I would rather do myself is to ask about kinds of birds. So we could come in here and we could ask about hummingbirds. Have you ever seen a hummingbird in a grassland, alpine or dry? I don't think so. We can say that these are the kinds of places that you're expecting to see a hummingbird, okay? If you wanted some omnivore, that means they eat everything, right? Uh, so that's going to be grain and insects and so on. Here's the distribution there. Now, this is really fun, I think. The vegetation types all have the same number of omnivores. I'm getting my neck way out. So there must be something about working on the ground. Everybody's okay on the ground. Under the forest, there's the same amount, apparently, as there is under the dry grassland or under the alpine. Okay, and we can run across to others of these uh, that the, the ground-picking carnivores, primarily dealing with insects uh, on the ground, it's all the same again. So it's much more interesting, in my opinion, to try pulling these things out and discovering that there are some, I'll use the word guilds, who are uh, thrive in every vegetation type, the ground-picking carnivores and omnivores, and then there's some that are limited to, uh, uh, to particular places. Now, where would you think you'd find a woodpecker? I think woodpeckers are probably very common in the alpine, and they're probably very common in the dry grasslands. What do you think? Burn areas. What? Burn areas. Burned areas uh, in grassland burns or forest burns? Forest burns. Exactly. W would you ever expect to see a woodpecker in a grassland at all? Uh, what? Not. There's not any trees to peck on. So it'd have to be out there for some other reason. <laughs> now, I'm waiting to get Rick's feedback on this. <laughs> uh, Okay, so this is even worse, and this is a terrible thing to read. Uh, 
So this is a chart that's just like those charts that I made for the plants. Uh, here are the vegetation types across the top. Dry, Lula, Stipa, uh, Agriparents, Bicatum, all the way up to Alpine. And then we could list some of these uh, rats that I have trouble with in the kitchen down the side. And uh, uh, so there probably are some that only like to be at high altitude. And there are probably some that only like to be at low altitude. And there are probably some that like to be in the middle. So we ought to have that diagonal picture like that. So uh, 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 let's see. Here's uh, Paramiscus right here is coming, what, uh, that's not right, that's, that's not. There's Paramiscus, Paramiscus manipulatus. Do you know that one? So if you go walking in the snow, there are these little uh, trapezoidal arrangements of footprints, and there's always a tail that's coming along with it, is that right? Uh, and it grows everywhere grows in the driest grasslands all the way up into the alpine. Now, how do you suppose that data was gathered? So we have a person named Dennis Flath who worked for years as a fish and game small mammal person. And he had a giant data set. And along came this young lady named Christy Allen who uh, put that all together. So we could run down here further and I'm, I'm having trouble reading most of these. Here, here, are, uh, here are some, uh, here's a, a uh, the, the Tamascurus is a, uh, is a chipmunk, right? And so are there any chipmunks in this, in this dry place? Is that, does it grow out there? No, but it's all across in these forest types. So again, if you can figure out these abbreviations, uh, you ought to be able to see who is everywhere, there's only one, who is uh, high or low, there's several there. Uh, let's see, that's a Microtus pennsylvanicus, Sorex, does anyone know Sorex? Let's see. Those are shrews, a couple of shrews are in there, and then there's Thomomys. Uh, that's a true gopher, right? Now, Rick, is that right? I think so. Okay, and then there are some that like it in the middle and some that like it high. So again, I'm, I'm not pushing all of these names at you, but it's out there. Now, where else are we going to get that? I think you're going to have a hard time finding anything that's that condensed across that many types. And so you can thank Flath for gathering all that data. It took him years to do it. And Christy Allen for putting it together. Most of the graduate students I've worked with, I've been able to keep up with, but Christy, I've lost. Okay, here's another one. Uh, uh, Bula, Douglas fir, Subalpin fir, Alpine. And we, we're calling these macro fungi. What's that mean? It means mushrooms. And are they decomposers too, just like birds and small mammals? Sure, they're eating this stuff up. So if we go into the Boolua grassland, he only found three species. Uh, so let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna comment. Maybe it's <coughs> at my own uh, risk. But if you have a class coming up, I know that I will be running a little long and you should feel free to leave. Now then, my expectation is everyone will immediately leave. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so in the grassland, there were only three, and in the Alpine, none. Now, we know that there are more mushrooms in both of those places than they are. But what's interesting here is in the forest, there were a lot of mushrooms. There are 60 mushrooms in Subalpine fir forest, 60 mushrooms in Doug fir forest. And then how many mushrooms were exclusive to their place? The three mushrooms we found in the Boulua were only found in the Boulua. Half of the mushrooms in the Douglas fir were found only in the Douglas fir. The other half were in the, in the subalpine fir. Half in the subalpine fir were down too. 
and then this species per plot, we were using one by 25 meter plots, and then we had four of them in each stand, so we got that. And then there's a percentage of those which are mycorrhizal. What's that mean? That they're attached to, no, oh, somebody had it. Plants in association with uh, uh, particular plant roots. Okay, so of the whole bunch, uh, about a third, yeah, about a third were mycorrhizal. Okay, now then, let's go down and measure the productivity. Nobody's got any of that. Does anyone care? Does anyone eat mushrooms? A few weirdo people. Anybody else? <laughs> well, I think maybe chipmunks? Squirrels? How about? Slugs. University of, oh, slugs, that's very good. University of Montana people, they send their grizzlies out, right? So they eat them. So it might be interesting to know what the weight was. So here we're getting something like, uh, it looks like half a gram per hectare per year. Boy, that's not much. And so it looks like there are more when you look at it and I think it's because they're so full of water, there's hardly anything there. And the fish and game people think these mushrooms are important. Boy, those bears must be really looking. How do you know how much mushroom a bear is eating? Scat. Yeah, you have to get the scat. And then the mushroom is going to, you know, they just melt in your mouth, don't they? So. How we know, you have to look for the spores in there. So somebody's going to go through all that. Now, you could do the same thing with plant material. You can go through the gut of an animal and uh, determine what he's been eating and the relative amounts. Uh, OK, so the subalpine fur and the, and the uh, abies have roughly the same amounts. The alpine and the, uh, uh, and the dry grasslands have less and those will certainly be underestimated. Now, these are underestimated too. He went out six times a year or eight times a year, and he gathered everything he could find and dried it and weighed it. So anybody who came up after he came up before and before he came up next, that's lost. And there's, we don't have an estimate of how much that was. Now look at this, this is interesting. Uh, a third of the material here in terms of species present were mycorrhizal. Down here, 70, 75% are mycorrhizal species. What's happening there? You know, you can ask all these questions and I'm just forcing you with not enough time to think about them. It's always rude to give a test and not to give it enough time to ponder it. But what I would deduce uh, is that mycorrhizal fungi are heavier than non-mycorrhizal fungi. So do you know mushrooms? What are the boletes? Do you know what boletus is? It's a nice, big, fat mushroom uh, with the spores falling out below. So that's a major cause of what's happening there. Okay. Now, here's a favorite kind of animal of mine. These are a lot more fun <laughs> than uh, birds, for instance. Uh, so these are nematodes. Do you know what a nematode is? A nematode is a little worm. It doesn't have spirals around it like an earthworm, and it sort of moves along by whipping itself back and forth. And uh, here's how many nematodes there were in millions per meter squared in uh, several vegetation types. Idaho fescue, uh, sagebrush, aspen, Douglas fir, and subalpine fir. And what you can see 
is, is that the, the grassland types have way more nematodes. So that looks like they have about five and a half millions of nematodes per meter squared. Then if you want to partition that into the kinds, these are the predatory, these are the uh, carnivorous ones. And let's see, we have to read that down here. Uh, let's see. Uh, the types are, the first bar is the herbivores, that's the ones that's eating plants. The second bar is the microvore. What could that be? Not plants, but bacteria and the like. Uh, and the third is the predators who are eating the other nematodes. Okay. Uh, and so then they are, each of those bars down there is divided into five pieces so you can see who's in the very surface and who's at successively greater depths. Okay, so this is how many of them there are and this is how much they weigh. So it looks like where they're most numerous is out here in the grasslands again and it looks like it's about 0.75, uh, hear me, Oh, grams per meter squared. Does 0.75 grams per meter squared sound like much? A meter squared is this big, and how much is a gram? You know, I think a gram is a nickel, isn't it? Okay, 0.75. Let's cut, just call it a nickel per meter squared. Is that a lot or a little? It's about the same as cows in the same grazing area. Crowd, cows aren't very big. So it looks to me like there's a real economically uh, interesting, if you're an entrepreneur, uh, thing you might do. And that is, there's something called a rooping iron and a stob. You drive a stake in the ground, you call it a stob. They do this all the time in North Carolina. And then you take a piece of iron that's somewhat flexible and you saw it back and forth and it makes a screeching noise, and all the worms come out of the ground, and then you can rake them up. That's the way they get fish bait down there. So why don't you get yourself a stob and a rooping iron and make them all come up? And there's gonna be as many as there are cows. So next thing is you're gonna to have to market it. So do you think if you take those to McDonald's that they will buy them and mix them in with other meat? Sell it for a profit? What? <laughs> okay. Now, this is really getting bad. So I fear that I've only got one more. And this is a favorite one, and I haven't thought about it for years. But I just got to thinking about it. So this is an indication of microbes. And what it is, is these are the months of the year, and this is how much ammonium is coming off of the uh, ground. So NH4 is bound to soils. NH3, though, is a gas, and it'll come right out. And so in uh, a Bootloo grassland, there's a lot in the early year there's a lot, a little out here. You can see this wraps around, right? And there's almost nothing in the winter. So where does the ammonia come from that's coming off? Why should soils give off ammonia? So what contains nitrogen? What compounds contain nitrogen? Proteins, excellent. Is it, that's going to be far and away the largest. What's the second largest? Every cell contains some, right? The nucleic acids. Okay. So if there's ammonia coming off, it must be because some decomposer is breaking it down. And it's coming off. Okay, and there's a lot coming off in the spring and early summer. Now, 
that's in a Boulou grassland. But we come down to an Ag Spick grassland, the foothills around Butte, it's not so much. And then if we go out to the uh, Doug Douglas fir and subalpine fir, there's hardly any coming off. This is way lower than those two, right? Now, when somebody shows you a graph, you're always supposed to look and see what's across the bottom. What's across the bottom is months. That's simple. Now look on this graph and see what's happening. What kind of a graph is this? It's not linear, is it? So this is about this high, and this looks, which is like, um, I don't know, a finger's width. And this is uh, 12 fingers width. So is this 12 times as much as this? you're likely to be sucked into graphs like this, right? So it's not 12 times as much. This is about 10, and this is about 2,000. So it's much more. So there's a really lot coming off of those dry grasslands. So somebody is breaking down something out there, and it's all coming off. So that's an indication then that there's, uh, that there's some significant biological activity that's greater in the dry grasslands than it is in the forests. Okay. What do you suppose that could be? We've just looked at the fungi, and the fungi looked like they were far fewer in the grasslands than in the forests. So what are your alternatives? Bacteria. Excuse me? Bacteria. Maybe bacteria. Okay. Now, I, I should just leave it right there, but I'm amused by this graph and I keep appreciating it more. Uh, if you're always giving, we can try looking, I put some figures down here. A uh, 1,000 micrograms, that's this one, looks like maybe it's 3 kilograms per year. Doesn't seem like a lot, 3 kilograms per hectare per year. And that might even be a little high because it's not high like that throughout the year. So just say it's a kilogram per hectare per year. You know, if you keep gassing it off like this, it ought to all be gone in some time. So there must be a compensatory way to get nitrogen into those ecosystems. And how would that be? You're out there at the Three Forks State Park, you've all been there, up on top of the mesa. And it's a very short grassland, a Bulu grassland, and it's giving off a kilogram uh, per hectare per year, something like that. You'd think it had run out after a while. So how could you not run out? You'd have to have somebody fixing the nitrogen. Who said that? Was that you? Good for you. Oh, okay. Well, take credit for wherever you can get it, right? <laughs> okay. Now, when you're out there, do you ever see legumes? I think there are almost none. So are there any other plants that fix nitrogen? Excuse me? I didn't Lu hear it. She lupine. said lupine. Yeah. Lupine. Oh, yeah. Well, lupine is a, a legume. So I'm, alfalfa is another legume, right? And there is, le there is alfalfa growing there. It's a nasty weed in the park. Uh, and there's also sweet clover growing there, another nasty weed in the park. 
So uh, it might be a legume, but I don't see them there. And so what's there also? It's kind of crusty out there. No stock. And blue algae. Blue green algae also fixed. And if you go out there in the right spring day, it looks like there's guts on the ground. Kind of dark green guts around. I could not figure out what that is. But if you taste it, it tastes like, no, no, you got that wrong. It tastes like green algae. I'm sh I think that's what's doing it. So that's important. And when's it doing it? It's doing it in the spring when there's a lot of rain there. Okay, I don't know what my uh, place is. I'm 10 minutes over, right? So uh, I'll stand right here and think with you. I think there's a lot more to this story than what, what I've told you, and I'm not going to tell you. Thank you, you, because thank you I, so much, Dan. I want to publish it first. Uh, okay. Thank so, you. Uh, so if you